Hello, I'm Paul Quinn, and I'm the director of the Chichester Centre for Fairy Tales, Fantasy and Speculative Fictions at the University of Chichester in West Sussex. This is a recording of a lecture given in Chichester on the 11th of December 2023. I'm re-recording it tonight because we had technical difficulties. The lecture is entitled Doctor Who, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, Peculiarly British Fairy Tales. If Nigel Neal's first three Quatermass serials are the obvious television antecedents for Doctor Who, that relationship only really becomes obvious in John Pertwee's debut season in 1970, a season which borrows liberally from Neal's 1950s dramas and establishes firmly Doctor Who's indebtedness, along with most other film and television science fiction, to Neal's seminal texts. The other obvious television predecessor to Doctor Who, certainly discernible in the programme's first season, notably in the first two or three stories when Doctor Who's production team was still developing a fixed vision of the programme and its characters, is ATV's Pathfinder series. Purists may sneer at the idea that Doctor Who is science fiction at all, and there is a sense that such criticism is justified. Quickly abandoning the educational element of the programme, Doctor Who became a family adventure programme, with the future and the obvious hardware associated with that future vision weapons, spacecraft, alien worlds, frequently used in a way reminiscent of the serials of the 1930s, Flash Gordon being an obvious example. Once Doctor Who becomes more formulaic from the fifth season onwards, the points of reference and television influences are often drawn from contemporary films and televisions. television. Thrillers, bases under siege and monsters of the week. Film and television remain the clear influence on Doctor Who in the early 70s. While Tom Baker's first three seasons see the programme shift towards the type of horror genre of which the key examples and influences on Doctor Who are the horror films produced by Hammer and also the monster sequence produced by Warner Brothers. The appearance of Star Wars in 1977 and Alien two years later seemed to force Doctor Who back into space, with space opera and space horror appearing with mixed results. But we can also position Doctor Who within the fairy tale tradition across both Old Who and New Who. Stephen Moffat's tenure as showrunner sees the programme described as fairy tale like Quite what people mean by that is unclear, and that's something we will return to later. And it may not be immediately obvious that Doctor Who engages with what most people would recognise as fairy tale. Fairies as diminutive beings, good or mischievous, in stories written for children. That model only really emerges during the 19th and 20th centuries, and is challenged by two key mid-20th century writers who are writers of fairy tales but not in the sense much of the general public would recognise. I'm referring to, of course, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Both write about and produce a particular type of fairy tale, one which has its roots in much earlier literature. That both Lewis and Tolkien view their works about Narnia and Middle-earth as fairy tales is evident. What they mean by fairy tale is far removed from a narrow interpretation of the term and allows for the positioning of Doctor Who within a reinterpreted idea of the fairy tale genre. In his 1939 Andrew Lang lecture on fairy stories, published in 1947 and revised for republication in 1964, Tolkien presents the first sustained academic analysis of the fairy tale, except he doesn't. What he actually does is describe his own work, which is a story set in fairy. We know Tolkien was working what became the Fellowship of the Ring when he was preparing the lecture. Within the lecture, Tolkien challenges a number of key assumptions connected with the fairy tale even to the extent of questioning the phrase fairy story. Tolkien argues the OED contains no references to the combination fairy stories and is unhelpful on the subject of fairies generally. Tolkien in the lecture traces the long road to the 19th century idea of the fairy as diminutive supernatural beings in stories for children, blaming Shakespeare and Drayton in particular for this culturally dominant image of the fairy. I think Tolkien misread Shakespeare at this point there are still elements of the more ambivalent fae in A Midsummer Night's Dream. I suspect the problem is late 19th century adaptations of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which are influenced by Barry's construction of the fairy, and which resulted in Peasblotten et al, played by children, and the text, which contains brutalities and political commentary on the mid-1590s, being reduced to a favourite for production by schools, badly, as portrayed brilliantly in a sketch on the far show. Tolkien argues fairy, as a noun, is more or less equivalent to elf, and that fairy is a relatively modern word, hardly used until the Tudor period. The first quotation from the OED, the only one before 1450 AD, is significant. 
It's taken from John Gower and is recorded as, as he were a fairy. But Tolkien argues that this is a mistake. And what Gower actually wrote was, as he were of fairy. That is, says Tolkien, as if he were come from fairy. For Tolkien, this is Elfland rather than a definition of fairy. Tolkien argues, fairy stories are not normal, are not in normal English usage about fairies or elves, but rather stories about fairy, that is fairy, F-A-E-R-I-E, -E, the realm or state in which fairies have their being. Tolkien continues, fairy contains many things besides elves and fays and besides dwarves, witches, trolls, giants or dragons. It holds the seas, the sun, the moon, the sky and the earth and all things that are in it, tree and bird, water and stone, wine and bread and ourselves, mortal men, when we are enchanted. For Tolkien, stories that are actually concerned primarily with fairies, that is with creatures that might also in modern English be called elves, are quote, relatively rare and as a rule, not very interesting. Most good fairy stories are about the adventures of men in the perilous realm or unto its shadowy marches. And that's an important term that I'm going to come back to. Tolkien is also at pains to challenge the assumption that fairy stories are for children and can thus be dismissed as disposal ephemera. Tolkien bemoans the relegation of fairy stories to the nursery. Tolkien argues, among those who, are still, who still have enough wisdom not to think fairy stories pernicious, the common opinion seems to be that there is a natural connection between the minds of children and fairy stories of the same order as the connection between children's bodies and milk. I think this is an error, at best an error of full sentiment, and one that is therefore most often made by those who, for whatever private reasons, such as childlessness, tend to think of children as a special kind of creature, almost a different race, rather than as normal, if immature, members of a particular family and of the human family at large. For Tolkien, this association of, of the fairy tale with childhood is wrong, what he describes as an accident of domestic history. The fairy tales were important to Tolkien, both as a reader and a writer, is apparent from on fairy stories, but also from his letters and from reading the legendarium, with the argument and discussion of on fairy stories firmly in mind. Tolkien's letters provide a fascinating insight into his relationship with fairy tales. In a letter of 1961, to his aunt, Jane Neve, Tolkien declares of the Pied Piper, I loathe it. God help the children. I would as soon give them crude and vulgar plastic toys, which of course they will play with to the ruin of their taste. Terrible presage of the most vulgar elements in Disney. In the same letter, Tolkien reveals that he disliked Hans Anderson, quote, intensely. The vividness of that distaste is the chief thing that I carried down the years in connection with his name. This dislike of Anderson, which I can understand, and which is repeated by P.L. Travers, the author of Mary Poppins, is interesting given some of Anderson's longer stories, notably The Tinderbox, The Snow Queen, which is itself an obvious influence on C.S. Lewis's The White Witch, and The Little Mermaid, are much closer to the description of the fairy tale in On Fairy Stories than many other examples. <clears throat> Tolkien's letters, the text of On Fairy Stories, the work of critics, all demonstrate how important fairy tales were to Tolkien and how important they are in his construction of the legendary. He read the Grimm's and as Borshin and Moe, the Norwegian answers of Grimm's, Campbell Scottish folk, folk tales, and the work of the French authors Charles Perrault and Catherine de Arnold. Writing to Stanley Unwin in 1937, Tolkien describes the dwarves in The Hobbit as conventional and inconsistent Grimm's dwarves, but that he took most of their names and Gandalf's from the Elder Edda, the Scandinavian epic. The trolls in The Hobbit are from Scandinavian folklore, which Skull and Hammond attribute to Icelandic au pairs employed by the Tolkien's, which are just as likely drawn from as Borshin and Moe. Richard C. West argues the account of the imprisonment of Luthien by her father is a version of both Sleeping Beauty and Rapunzel. We find across as Borshin and Mo, the idea of the folk tale as an epic or pseudo epic, or containing the echo or shadow of an actual epic. We can see in an English context, Jack the Giant Killer, published by both Lang and his rival and fellow folklore society luminary, Joseph Jacobs, presented as an Arthurian text with the same type of expansive quasi quest found in the Norwegian collections of as Borshin and Mo. We know Tolkien read the work of the major British fairy tale writer George MacDonald, 
Skull and Hammond suggest the Ents owe much to MacDonald, although Tol Tolkien later rejected the work of MacDonald, partly, I suspect, on religious grounds. C.S. Lewis, in contrast, remained devoted to MacDonald. Part of the attraction for Lewis was almost certainly religious. And notably, while MacDonald has disappeared from view in, in this country, he is still read in America by the same type of people, that is, evangelicals, who read Lewis. This 1961 letter is important as it indicates the centrality of on fairy stories to Tolkien's work from 1939 onwards. Coming two years after the publication of The Hobbit and given during the period at which Tolkien was working on what would become The Fellowship of the Ring, the arguments in on fairy stories help us to develop a picture of Tolkien's thinking at this point in his career. In writing to his aunt about his readers, Tolkien states, I'm not interested in the child as such, modern or otherwise, and certainly have no intention of meeting him or her halfway. It is a mistaken thing to do anyway, either useless when applied to the stupid or pernicious when inflicted on the gifted. I've only made the mistake of trying to do it to my lasting regret once, and I'm glad to say with the disapproval of intelligent children. In the earlier part of The Hobbit, but I had not then given any serious thought to the matter. I had not freed myself from the contemporary delusions about fairy stories and children. Tolkien had already addressed his regrets about writing The Hobbit for children. In a 1959 letter to Walter Allen at the New Statesman to turn down an invitation to take part in the symposium on children's literature, Tolkien tells Allen, I've said all that I have to say about writing for children in my contribution on fairy stories. It has no special interest to me. Tolkien continues, when I published The Hobbit, hurriedly, without due consideration, I was still influenced by the convention that fairy stories are naturally directed to children, with or without the silly added waggery from seven to seventy. And I had children of my own. But the desire to address children as such had nothing to do with the story as such in itself or the urge to write it. But it had some unfortunate effects on the mode of expression and narrative method, which if I had not been rushed, I should have corrected. Intelligent children of good taste, of which there seem to be quite a number, have always, I'm glad to say, singled out the points in manner where the address is to children as blemishes. I'd given a great deal more thought to the matter before beginning the composition of The Lord of the Rings, and that work was not specially addressed to children or to any other class of people, but to anyone who enjoy a long, exciting story of the sort that I myself naturally enjoy. The reference to the, quote, silly added waggery from 7 to 70, looks like a criticism of 19th century ideas about the ideal readers of fairy stories. Wilde's claim of his tales being for children, people, uh, uh, sorry, being for childlike people from 18 to 80. George MacDonald's, uh, George MacDonald's appeal to the childlike reader who is happy with unsettled meanings. And the claims of the reviewer of the first English edition of Anderson's Tales that it was a book for grandfathers, no less than grandchildren. For Tolkien, the fairy story is for anyone not just children. And it is a long, exciting story. This is evident in the Lang Lecture, where we find the fairy story addressed in relation to Nordic and Icelandic sagas and Arthurian myth, and positioned within a much wider nexus of texts and crucially genres than a crude idea of the fairy tale as a literature for children usually allows. We can add Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen to this collection of texts. In both the Lang Lecture and in a number of letters, Tolkien lists Spencer as evidence of the historical existence of the type of adventure in fairyland, which he argues is the essence of the fairy tale. Red Cross Knight, the Knight of Holiness in Book One of the Fairy Queen, is referred to as both Elfin and Elf. We can see the appeal of Spencer to Tolkien, even though Tolkien rejects the type of allegorical reading of his text, which Spencer actually requires of the fairy queen. We can also see why Tolkien had to exclude particular types of text from his discussion of fairy tales and why his lecture appears to be more concerned with fantasy writing, his own writing, than what we would usually judge to be fairy tales. Fairy tales, particularly if we think of the major collections from the 19th century, are frequently short narratives, often with nameless characters whose attributes are contained within their titles, king, queen, princess, prince, witch, stepmother, fairy or fairy godmother who behave in particular ways, hence the analysis of the fairy tale or folklore by structuralists. There is often a moral, hence the fairy tale appears to have a didactic function, hence the idea that they are for children. It's hard to make this pattern fit Tolkien's work, expansive, 
dealing with thousands of years of history, quests which cover hundreds of miles, multiple characters with names and distinct characters. What we find in On Fairy Stories is Tolkien's analysis of his own creative process, his role as the sub-creator, the creator of a secondary world, a place, Tolkien states, which your mind can enter. Inside it, what he, that is the story maker or sub-creator, relates is true. It accords with the laws of that world. You therefore believe it while you are, as it were, inside. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken, the magic, or rather, the art has failed. <clears throat> we can see this idea of immersion in a number of fairy tales, but the short, limited nature of the fairy tale usually precludes the type of world building implied by Tolkien's description in On Fairy Stories. What Tolkien describes appears to be the modern fantasy novel with its immersive world building, which has to be a, a total experience, otherwise it fails. It is the type of fantasy novel which is associated with Tolkien, but Tolkien is not really a fantasy writer at all not in the sense the term developed after Tolkien. Tolkien becomes a fantasy writer after the fact. As Joseph, Young, as Joseph Rex Young argues, he is positioned at the start of a chronology of fantasy writers who followed him and who appear to write in a similar fashion to him. However, Tolkien's starting point is very different from those writers who followed him. Tolkien's starting points are myth and legend and an absence what Tom Shipley describes as an, an asterisk mythology, a reconstruction of what an English mythology might have looked like had it survived. Tolkien's deep interest in Northern mythology, an interest he shared with C.S. Lewis, made him acutely aware of the absence from English of the type of epic or saga found in Scandinavian countries and Germany. There is no equivalent in English of the Edda or the Germanic legends of Siegfried. Beowulf, for example, is short in comparison with other European texts from the same period. It comes in at just over 3,000 lines long. Tolkien, on occasions, lamented the loss or absence of the English epic and looked to the Norman invasion as the moment of erasure. The legendarium is at least a part, at least in part, an attempt to fill that cultural lacuna. The legendarium thus walks a line between myth and history. This is an English epic but one set in fairy, making it both pseudo-history and myth and fantasy. C.S. Lewis had less high-minded ideas in mind when he wrote the first of the Chronicles of Narnia. The Christian element, which Lewis claimed was unconscious when he wrote The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, is explicit by the time he reached the last battle in 1956. But Lewis's approach to the fairy tales is similar to Tolkien, even if the theological outcome is very different. Tolkien, of course, claimed that he was writing a uh, Catholic epic, or became increasingly Catholic as he went on. Lewis comes from a broadly Anglican position. <coughs> Lewis was also a keen reader of fairy stories and Norman myth. We know he read and enjoyed the work of George MacDonald, whose novel Fantasies draws upon the fairy queen. We can see too, as I've suggested earlier, and I will discuss in greater detail later, Lewis making use of the ideas and images found in the work of Hans Christian Andersen. Like Tolkien, Lewis was keen to challenge the idea that fairy stories are for children. We can see this in an article written for the New York Times in 1956. Unlike Tolkien, Lewis is prepared to include disparate elements in his fairy tale saga, The Chronicles of Narnia. Hence the combination in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the appearance of Father Christmas, which troubled Tolkien, fawns, and the Anderson-inspired figure of the White Witch. We know from the dedication of the line the witch in the wardrobe to his goddaughter that Lewis views the book as a fairy story. He's explicit. He knows his goddaughter will be too old to read fairy tales by the time he is finished, but he hopes one day she'll be old enough to read fairy tales again. We have a return to the idea of the reader of the fairy tales across a wide age range. Lewis, like Tolkien, is also influenced by older narratives set in the realm of fairy notably Spencer's The Very Queen. That C.S. Lewis had an affinity with the work of Edmund Spencer is evident from Lewis's academic publishing, with detailed analysis of Spencer featuring both the allegory of love and English literature in the 16th century, excluding drama. For my late colleague, Bill Gray, founder of the original version of the Fantasy Centre at Chichester, Lewis's most revealing thoughts on Spencer are to be found in the essay on reading The Fairy Queen. <clears throat> 
for Lewis, it's best to have made one's first acquaintance with Spencer in a very large, preferably illustrated edition of the Fairy Queen on a wet day between the ages of 12 and 16. Lewis continues, it's best to begin with the taste for the homespun and to keep your Fairy Queen on the same shelf with Bunyan and Mallory, and even with Jack the Giant Killer. But this is the paradox of Spencer's poem. It's not really medieval. No medieval romance is very like it. Yet everyone who has really enjoyed it has enjoyed it as a consummation of the Middle Ages. The reference to Mallory and to Jack the Giant Killer, presumably the fairy tale published by both Joseph Jacobs and Andrew Lang during the Vogue for British fairy tale collections in the late 19th century. These references emphasize Lewis's position of the fairy queen as an Arthurian text and thus part of the 19th century Vogue for faux medievalism and King Arthur. According to Bill Gray, for Lewis, what the fairy queen requires of the reader is not critical acumen, but a childlike attention to the mood of the story. For Lewis, its primary appeal, that is the fairy queen, is the most naive and innocent tastes. It demands of us a child's love of marvels and dread of bogies, a boy's thirst for adventures. This may strike us as a peculiarly simplistic way of reading the fairy queen, but as A.M. Wilson suggests, in showing us what he loves about the fairy queen, Lewis is actually writing a recipe for how to construct the Narnia Chronicles. For Lewis, it is the fantastical and the romance elements which appeal in the Fairy Queen, and which provide one of the foundations upon which Lewis built his miniature Fairy Queen, to use Doris Meyer's phrase to describe the Chronicles of Narnia. This engagement with the fantastical and adventure elements in the Fairy Queen is a less sophisticated version of what Tolkien finds in Spencer's poem, but it's common to both writers, Tolkien and Lewis, and this adventure element is one way we can address the question of the fairy tale in Doctor Who. So where does that leave Doctor Who? Those of us brought up on Peter Hanning's guidebooks to Doctor Who will recall the literary model supposedly haunting Sidney Newman's imagination was the time traveller of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. We can perhaps see an echo of Wells in the figure of the Doctor and in the time travel concept at the heart of Doctor Who. There is something of the Wellsian scientific romance in Doctor Who, to paraphrase Lawrence Scarman in Pyramids of Mars. But it's harder to spot Wells's social commentary in Doctor Who or the discourse around degeneration. Wells offers the possibility that man has reached his zenith in the late 19th century, that it's downhill to the world of the Morlocks and the Elon. It's a suggestion of de degeneration in 1989's Ghostlight, of course. Doctor Who, with notable exceptions, is optimistic about mankind's future. In fact, the most Wellsian version of Doctor Who, the brilliant amateur scientist who builds his own time machine, is to be found in the film Doctor Who and the Daleks, starring Peter Cushing, as a human scientist who literally builds his time machine at the bottom of the garden. The Cushing film, Wells and Doctor Who, all provide important examples of the British cult of the amateur, the horror of being a professional. In this, Doctor Who is in stark contrast to American series like Star Trek and Babylon 5, which are all based around quasi-military organisations which fetishise uniforms. Even when the crew of Babylon 5 break away from the totalitarian, totalitarian Earth regime and state they'll not wear their Earth Force uniforms again until the fascists have been driven from power, they then receive new uniforms. They can't really cope unless they're in uniform. Doctor Who, with its cult of the amateur, its uh, avoidance of uniforms apart from John Pertwee's period, and even then unit becomes Dad's Army in space. Doctor Who is thus doing something very different from its American counterparts. Indicative, I think, of the different influences on the respective series, which include fairy tales. Certainly the Radio Times' old description of Doctor Who as the children's own adventure series, which adults adore, recalls and echoes the MacDonald wild idea of the reader between eight and 80 the figure we can detect in Lewis's dedication of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, an idea which clearly irritated Tolkien. Tolkien's idea of the true adventure in fairy being about man in the perilous realm or in its shadow is the basic model for Doctor Who in its classic format of a young person, usually female from contemporary Earth, traveling with the Doctor to alien worlds or to periods of Earth's past, which may as well be alien. That model is, man in the perilous realm or in its shadows. <clears throat> this is the model we find in Doctor Who's imperial phase from 1971 to 76, with a particular focus in series seasons 11, 13, and for the first half of season 14. 
and again from 1984 through to the end of the original run of Doctor Who in 1989. Here we have the Doctor with a single female companion, unit stories and those stories in season 12, which see Harry Sullivan traveling with the Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith aside, traveling to perilous realms or to extend the Tolkien reading and to expand it to include Lewis. They travel to secondary or sub-creations or to portal worlds in which the companions from contemporary Earth become the method by which we, the viewer, learn about the secondary world. Tolkien, of course, doesn't use that model. We learn about Middle Earth, its cultures, peoples and histories through characters who are from Middle Earth. We learn with them, notably Bilbo Baggins and Frodo Baggins, as they discover things about Middle Earth about which they previously knew, knew nothing. This is Farrah Mendelssohn's idea of immersion and Joseph Rex Young's theory of the focalizer, the character through whom we witness and discover um, the portal world. Tolkien's vision is total. We are immersed in Middle Earth, we believe in it in a way we may not always believe, say, in Westeros, with Frodo and Bilbo acting as focalizers. The extent to which immersion applies to Doctor Who is debatable. Time and money often preclude the type of visual storytelling to create an alien world in which we can really believe. Robert Holmes' overrated season 15 story, The Rebus Operation, oh no, sorry, season 16, is a good example of a civilization in which we believe as is the robot dependent society created in season 14's Robots of Death. While Robert Holmes again constructs an utterly, conv constructs an utterly convincing war-torn 51st century, which we never see in a few lines of dialogue in season 14's problematic Talons of Wen Chihang. This story demonstrates the BBC's strength in recreating the past, far more successfully than attempts to create an alien planet. Here, the past becomes the portal world, one created through conscious references to a wide range of popular texts from the late Victorian period, notably Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories, The Phantom of the Opera, and, regretfully, Sax Romer's Fu Manchu stories. Alongside these are references to Jack the Ripper and a general sense of the period. Because we recognise this world through these cultural reference points, we do not require a guide. Rather, part of the enjoyment is watching the usual focaliser in this instance, the alien or human descendant Leela, trying to negotiate a world which is entirely alien to her. Leela is an example of the type of alien character who becomes a companion for much of the late 1970s and into the 1980s. Significantly, modern Doctor Who has avoided the alien companion, returning to the model for much of 2005 through 2017, and again in the forthcoming series, of a single female companion travelling with the character of the Doctor. This has two functions. It acts for the general audience as a reminder of when Doctor Who was good, ignoring the fact that this is also the model to be found just before, during and after the cancellation crisis of the mid-80s and during the late golden phase in the final three seasons of the original run. It also restores the audience identification figure, the character through whom we learn about the secondary creation. This connects Doctor Who quite firmly to the type of adventure in the land of fairy described by Tolkien, and the method of understanding these fairy worlds discernible in the works of C.S. Lewis. The Doctor's companion is our Lucy. The TARDIS becomes the wardrobe through which we enter the secondary world along with the Lucy figure. However, this model is complicated almost immediately. In the very first season of classic Doctor Who, Susan should act as our Lucy figure. The problem is she cannot as she is the Doctor's granddaughter and thus an alien. This means the audience identification figures in the first year of Doctor Who are Ian and Barbara, significantly older than the original target audience of 8 to 14 year olds, significantly older than most companions, and thus changing the focus of the programme. This may partly explain Doctor Who's transcending the idea of it being a children's programme, and with its family audience, move it closer to the model of reader of fairy stories encapsulated in Lewis's dedication at the start of the line of Witch in the Wardrobe. MacDonald's idea of the childlike reader, and Wilde's readers aged between 8 and 80. <clears throat> the reason why Susan had to become the Doctor's granddaughter also indicates an affinity, if not a direct repetition, of an idea associated with C.S. Lewis. Anthony Coburn, the writer of An Earthly Child, a story which introduces the character of the Doctor in the TARDIS, was concerned that people would suggest something improper 
in a teenage girl traveling with an older male who is not a relative. Hence Susan's transformation into both granddaughter and alien and the loss of audience identification. But this incident also demonstrates the fear of sexuality that haunts classic Doctor Who and which to an extent has impacted on New Who at various points. This fear of sexuality, notably pubescent female sexuality, is also found in Lewis. It's partly indicative of his reading of 18th and 19th century fairy tales, notably the work of Charles Perrault, the Brothers Grimm, and Hans Christian Andersen. It's also indicative of Lewis's own sexual pathology. In fairy tales of the 18th and 19th century, the central female figure must be simultaneously a child and marriageable. That is, they must be children, but also have achieved puberty. They must be sexually innocent and sexually available. This gets the fairy tale into very strange places, such as Snow White being seven when her stepmother demands she be killed and butchered for her to eat parts of the body. But also by the close of the narrative, it's not clear how much time has passed, Snow White is now a corpse in a glass coffin who attracts the attention of the prince. Thus, there is both the possibility of paedophilia and necrophilia in Snow White. In Anderson's The Red Shoes, Karen makes her confirmation, which establishes her as a teenager. She desires the red shoes, she wears them to church, she dances, she commits an unnamed sin. But red, dancing and her age imply something sexual. Her punishment is to dance until the point of madness, at which point she begs an executioner to cut off her feet. He duly obliges, and even then, Anderson will not let her die. Only after she has repented, sans feet, will Anderson let her die, but we're assured that she'll go to heaven, and that's meant to be a comfort to us. In the last battle, the final book in the Chronicles of Narnia, all the children who have enjoyed adventures in Narnia and who we have followed on those adventures die in a train crash, with the exception of Susan, who of course is one of the original children who go to Narnia. As modern readers, including Philip Pullman, we should be horrified by this ending. But Lewis describes the children entering Aslan's barn. They achieve heaven, all of them except for Susan. Susan is excluded because she no longer believes in Narnia. She has grown up. She is now interested in stockings, note the focus on feet, and boys. She has hit puberty. I think there's also a reference to lipstick. As her brother states, she is no longer a friend of Narnia. In a letter to a child, Lewis states, Peter gets back to Narnia. I'm afraid Susan does not. Haven't you noticed in the two books you've read that she's rather fond of being too grown up? I'm sorry to say that that side of her got stronger and she forgot about Narnia. The books don't tell us what happened to Susan. She's left alive in the world at the end, having been turned into a rather silly, conceited young woman. But there is plenty of time for her to mend, and perhaps she will get to Aslan's country in the end, in her own way. I think that whatever she has seen in Narnia, she could, if she was that sort, if it will, if she was the sort that wanted to, persuade herself as she grew up that it was all nonsense. The implication is clear. Sexual maturity cuts the character off from the sub-creation. Their adventuring has to stop. In Lewis, it's also tied to belief. Susan, of course, thinks that uh, what's happened in Narnia is a dream. In Doctor Who, we find a means of removing companions from the TARDIS, of cutting them off from the sub-creation, from the adventures within, is to have them marry. This method of removal only happens to female characters, and female characters who are, in the narrative, young. We have an echo of the fairy tale version sexually available figure and the Lewis model. Thus, Doctor Who's Susan is bundled out of the TARDIS when she falls in love with the dreary David Campbell. Vicky is left in ancient Troy with Troilus, having taken on the name Cressida in that strange myth of history and um, myth and history that we find in, in the myth makers. The long-standing fan argument that Victoria and Jamie have sex in the fifth or sixth episode of Fury from the Deep is given credence by the fact that she leaves the TARDIS in, at the end of the story. But Jamie does not have to leave. Once Victoria becomes a sexual figure, she can longer continue the adventures. The complicating factor there, of course, is that she leaves to go and live with the Harrises, which seems to be a retreat back into a childhood that she's lost. But 
the potential for sex does mean it, it does it can be made to fit this model. Joe Grant leaves after she falls in love with Cliff Jones. Sarah Jane Smith, perhaps the ultimate companion in Old Who, is also a virginial figure who only leaves when the Doctor has to return to Gallifrey in season 14. But when Sarah Jane returns to New Who, it returns in New Who, right? she reveals she was in love with the Doctor. So her exit 30 years earlier can be retconned to this argument about active sexuality being incompatible with travelling in the TARDIS. We set aside Leela's exit. Her love affair with Commander Andred in The Invasion of Time is so unbelievable as for the marriage to be all too clearly a means of writing out the companion in a hurry. Once we get into the 1980s who, John Nathan Turner's rule, no hanky-panky in the TARDIS, means female companions become sex objects for men and teenage boys watching at home, but there is no sexual desire in the TARDIS in the televised episodes. Thus Janet Fielding as Tegan ends, uh, ends her run as a companion wearing a leather miniskirt and high heels, tottering away from the Daleks, while Nicola Bryant wears various clinging leotards and shorts. But the closest she comes to a sex scene is when she's dry humped by Jamie in 1985's Terrible, The Two Doctors. It's a troubling scene, one that looks like an attempted rape. The unbelievable marriage to Yukanis may or not, may not be true and takes place after she left the TARDIS and thus after her adventure has stopped. Even in the Andrew Cartmill-led renaissance of seasons 25 and 26, companions are not allowed to have desires, even in a run of the programme which is attempting to be more realistic. Thus, Ace's two potential love interests, Mike Smith, the neo-fascist army sergeant in Remembrance of the Daleks, is killed by a schoolgirl firing Dalek energy bolts. And Captain Zorin, the Russian army officer in The Curse of Fenric, is possessed by the titular ancient evil before being poisoned with chemical weapons wielded by a mutated human vampire from the far future. As anti-sex messages go, it's pretty strong. While I'm not suggesting there's a conscious evocation of this Lewisian idea that sexual maturity cuts women, and it is mostly women off from the perilous realm, there is a distinct similarity, a repetition of a pattern. Even in New Who, by accident or design, the Lewisian model of sex leading to the ending of the adventures in the perilous realm is still present. The only way Rose can fulfill her sexual desire for the Doctor is in a sealed parallel world with the messed up Metacrisis 10th Doctor. The realisation that she cannot have the Doctor means Martha leaves the TARDIS. Donna is only preserved from a similar fate because she is the Doctor's best friend, his mate, not a mate. And she's the oldest companion since Ian and Barbara two characters who probably have sex during the Romans, but who escape expulsion because they're well past puberty. Amy and Rory have sex, and in the TARDIS no less, and they're eventually killed by the Weeping Angels, sent back in time to die, after losing their child. It's a clear punishment here around sex. Clara is more complicated. But that's partly because her character is inconsistent. She leaves the TARDIS briefly after her relationship with the doomed Danny Pink, she leaves permanently either because the Doctor is in love with her or because she's now in a relationship with a shielder. The most complicated figure in relation to sex and exclusion from the perilous realm is the Doctor himself. In order to have his relationship with River Song, a relationship which we know is sexual, he has to stop travelling for the equivalent of 24 years. The credits at the end of this episode, the husbands of River Song, tell us that they lived happily ever after a formulation always associated with fairy tales. But we know that's not true, because we know where River is going. After this one night stand, 24 year relationship, River can no longer journey in the TARDIS. Rather, her next journey is to the library, where she dies, an event the audience has already witnessed. The incomparable silence in the library, Forest of the Dead, ends with River, her soul or spirit or memory patterns, now preserved in the library reading a bedtime story to three children, two of whom are computer generated, the third of which is the memory patterns of a child preserved from death by being uploaded to the computer while losing her physical form. The story we have just witnessed becomes the story River tells to the children. Famously, everybody lives, thus there is a happy ending. Silence in the library, Forest of the Dead, therefore becomes a fairy story. We see a similar pattern in The Big Bang, the Doctor sits by the bedside of the sleeping Amelia Pond, 
and tells her a bedtime story. He tells her the story of them, the story of him. The Doctor fictionalises himself. He becomes a fairy tale. This is the Moffat era fairy tale, along with the end of Forest of the Dead. This is a fairy tale far more than vague ideas of villages and Amy's cottage. Moffat transforms the story we have just watched, the stories of the entire season, that is season five, into a bedtime story for children, those watching at home, as actual children, and the childlike viewer, and for one child in particular, the sleeping Amelia Pond. The Doctor becomes the imaginary friend who has haunted Amelia from their first meeting. Simultaneously, he is real and a figment of her imagination, a product of a fairy story. This is complicated and represents a far more interesting engagement with ideas of storytelling, fairy tales in particular, and the works of Tolkien, and particularly Lewis, than we find in the most obvious C.S. Lewis-inspired story of New Who, 2011's flat Christmas special, The Doctor, The Widow and the Wardrobe, which, beyond its uh, title and the idea of entering the portal world through a box, is really a lazy amalgam of Narnia, the children of Green No, with a concern about the destruction of trees, which seems more Tolkien, than Lewis. But what are future engagements with fairy tales? Russell T. Davis's recent claims that Doctor Who will be more concerned with fantasy than hard sci fi, and we would query, I think, when Doctor Who was ever hard sci fi, seems to be supported by the trailer for this year's Christmas special. Goblins on a hot air balloon seem far more fantasy, fairy tale, or folklore than sci fi. The recent clip with the goblin singing about eating children and the appearance of the Goblin King are suggestive of Tolkien and folklore. If the leaked synopsis of the episode is correct, then Ruby is a foundling. Again, there is a suggestion of folklore and the idea of the changeling. Moreover, we can see the fantasy element in the recent episode, The Giggle. The toy maker is far more a creature of fantasy than sci-fi. His domain and his actions have a logic all of their own, which is the same internal logical argument we find in fairy tales and in texts like Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass. Realms that have their own logic, which we have to believe if the fantasy is to work. The giggle is a return to the type of fantasy we see in the celestial toy maker and in the mind robber. Stories which take place outside of space and time in realms which have their own rules, which clearly intersect with ideas and figures from children's literature, including fantasy and fairy tales. In the mind robber, we find Gulliver alongside clockwork robots, alongside psychotic versions of Nesbitt's Treasure Seekers, and alongside Rapunzel in a text in which the Doctor is terrified of becoming fiction by narrating future events of himself. This has an obvious connection with Moffat's ideas of the Doctor or others retelling events as story. The crucial difference is the narration comes afterwards. They become acts of storytelling with the threat of becoming fictional, with, without the threat rather, of becoming fictional which underpins the final episode of The Mind Rock. If Russell T. Davis is turning more to the fantastical, it thus marks a continuity with an established model in Doctor Who. It may not be the dominant model, but it's there, inspired by the expanded idea of fairy tale we find in the work of Tolkien and Lewis. Along with the work of these two authors, Doctor Who was and remains a peculiarly British fairy tale. Thank you. <laughs>